morning and welcome to Lakeshore Baptist Church via Zoom. My name is Reverend Grant Dooley. I am the Minister to Children, Youth, and Families, and I am happy and overjoyed to see you all here today. Here at Lakeshore, we are a welcoming and affirming community of Christians attempting to discover, articulate, and embody the meaning of the gospel in the world today. We welcome all because we believe that God's love knows no bound. So whoever and wherever you are, we are glad to have you with us, and we are more than stoked to experience this day of worship with you. Now, as we continue the ancient tradition of greeting one another, may we now spend the next few moments passing the peace of Christ to each other. May the peace of Christ be with you. And with you. Also with you. And with you. With you. And with you. The peace yes. of Christ be with you. Of all ages. Yes. Peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ with us. Jesse Smith, the peace of Christ with you. Peace of Christ to you all. It's good to see you. Hill, Lord, good to see you. The peace of Christ be with you. David, Maggie, David. the peace of Christ with you. Good to see you. Also with you. David, Stephen, founder. I'll be with you. The peace of Christ with you, buddy. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ, Faith. Oh, faith, God keep you. John DeVries, the peace of Christ with you, buddy. Peace Good to see all of you. As we continue in our worship, join me in our opening response. God said to Jacob and Joseph, Do not be afraid. The angel said to Mary and Joseph, do not be afraid. Jesus said to Peter on the water, Do not be afraid. The triune God says to us today, Do not be afraid. Let us pray. Loving and all merciful God, you are here in this worship with us across space, across time as people watch this week and yet we are one community in you. Come and fill this worship with your love and your spirit to remind us to not be afraid either, just as those people were millennia ago. Be with Grant as Grant preaches this morning and help us all to hear your wisdom throughout this service. In your name we pray. Amen. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the gospel of grace. May we pray together. God, we believe it is right and good that this morning in the middle of Pentecost, we remember the way your spirit moves among us to restore our souls and to renew our strength. This morning we need a fresh remembrance. 
So God, send your spirit in all these places from which we gather. We need your renewal and restoration, God, as we've never needed it before. We need you to still the storms, the winds, the waters, the waves, the worries. Oh God, you know our hearts. You know how many in this room, in this world, have prayed for months to help get us to the other side. You know our hearts so well, and you know what each of us is struggling with today. The pandemic and its layers upon layers of challenges and sorrows. The distance between us and those we love but cannot see in person. The anxiety about opening schools that extends from teachers to parents to grandparents to students. And God, through this week of change in our church, from the resignation of Charlie Fuller as our transition pastor, to whom we give our blessing and our thanks for his leadership on Sunday mornings and his care as pastoral figure throughout the week. To the loss of Annette Brister, your faithful saint, who showed us justice and care for God's children in practical, faithful ways. The new conversations and a renewing of our look to the future. You have been with us. You will be with us. So may we take heart. We are in a new place. Help us in this time of change. We need your spirit's guidance in every conversation, every prayer, every decision. Help us realize what is essential in our common life as Lakeshore Baptist Church and in our calling to live out your gospel in the world. May we take heart in you, O oh God, Spirit of God, peace who stilled the waters and the winds, the waves and the worries empower us, be our energy, our calmness, our vision as we care for each other. Raise us again to walk in newness of life with you, in whose strong name we pray. Amen.
draws near when the dead is past and gone by the river Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. Take my hand, precious Lord. Now hear these words from Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an immigrant, the land of Canaan. This is the story of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Billa and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of, of his other children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all their brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to them. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And so Joseph answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent Joseph from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flocks? The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands saying, let's not take his life. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, Flow, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a, ca a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way down to carry it to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite tra traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. This is a reading from one of our ancient stories. Thanks be to God. My dearest Lakeshore, I don't know where to begin. The first time I walked into your doors, I remember being in awe. The first sermon I heard from our pulpit was inspired by the romantic and erotic poem, Song of Solomon. 
Reverend Bert Burleson stood in front of all of you and expertly and humorously told the truth behind this text and the reality of its sexuality. I had never heard such a sermon and that in and of itself would have been enough for me. But then you all did something else. You laughed. I can still hear Bruce Evans' uninhibited laugh, we all know that laugh, snapping me out of my astonishment. Witnessing a community welcome such preaching and laugh, I fell in love with you then and there. That entire year, I dreamed of one day preaching to this community. I jumped into a Sunday school class that read Alison Bechtel's Fun Home and continued to laugh with John Warren. Steven Swanson made me think deeper and harder than any professor I ever had. I rotated around other classes and found the Metanoia group. I puzzled and dabbled at meditation alongside Claudia Beale and Sandy Londos. I, like many of us, have argued with Andy Powell and learned how argument between strangers can turn into a treasured relationship. I spent time with our youth and accidentally left Loom sleeping on a cot when it was time to go to dinner at midwinter. She continues to remind me of that deplorable act. The day I left Lakeshore and moved to Fort Worth was the day I was taught how difficult it is to find a spiritual home outside of our shared space a refrain we all know too well. And years later, here we sit. The church I fell in love with welcomed the whole me back. I was not only welcomed, but entrusted with the care of our children and families. This responsibility continues to humble me. As we already know, Reverend Charlie Fuller, our transition pastor, has formally resigned from his position as of last Monday. And if I may, I would like to take a moment. Charlie joined our staff in December of last year. As a young minister and new to my position, I was, to be honest, worried about working under an older white male. Sorry, Charlie. But this past year has been the most educational and supportive year of my entire ministerial career. Partly because of this position and all of the gifts and struggles it has. And partly, largely, because of Charlie's guidance and full acceptance of me as a minister. I've never worked with a more pastoral and caring person in my life. So to Charlie, Thank you for your devotion and love. Our church has been made better by your presence. We have much to learn and much growth ahead of us, but you taught me and so many of us that growth may be hard, but with the right guide, it doesn't have to be scary. It is queer that today's lectionary passage in Genesis is more fitting than I originally thought. This reading is one of my all-time favorites, and it has almost nothing to do with Joseph or his brothers. The author of Genesis introduces an unnamed character who can easily be forgotten. Due to today's reading, we, as followers of the lectionary, have experienced whiplash. Last week, we witnessed the story of Jacob wrestling with God, gaining a limp and a new name. We then skipped five chapters of Jacob's life. Somewhere in there, Esau forgives Jacob for all his dastardly deeds. We cruelly skip the horrific story of Dina, say her name, who was Israel slash Jacob's daughter. Then we finally skid to a stop at the feet of an arrogant younger brother whose ego breaks all possible relationships with his brothers. This story catapults us through the rest of Genesis. We learn intimately of Joseph's highs and lows. We hear, spoiler alert, the reconciliation of Joseph with his family. 
And all of this is a crazy 13 chapter roller coaster. But today we will have nothing to do with that tale. Instead, I invite us to turn our gaze upon an obscure man. In verse 15, Joseph is met by an unnamed man. Joseph, as we read, was seeking his brothers at his father's request. As Joseph stumbles around in a field, he bumps into a man who radically changed Joseph's life with one question. What are you seeking? Joseph, lost, is brought face to face, just like his father before him, with a man who sees through him. While Jacob wrestled, Joseph asks for directions. Joseph quickly answers the man's provocative question, but he answers incorrectly. You see, the man didn't ask, who are you seeking? He asked, what are you seeking? We know that Joseph gets the answer he wanted and leaves on his merry way, but I want us to sit with this question and not rush to an answer. What are you seeking? Church, we live in a world that is seeking. Our nation seeks racial justice and peace. Our country seeks equity for black and indigenous folks, queer folks, disabled folks, and poor folks. Our people seek guidance from our government while we are paralyzed by a pandemic that just won't end. We are seeking people. And if we're not careful, our outward seeking will blind us to the inner work our souls are seeking. My partner often reminds me what every frequent flyer hears regularly. When the plane is going down, you must put on your own oxygen mask before you can do any good for the people around you. My beloved Lakeshore, we are seekers. We are risk takers. We strive to expand our borders and welcome the stranger. We yearn to be a haven for the spiritually wounded we burst open our doors for the marginalized, and we also need to stop. We are like Joseph. When we are asked to move mountains and find the lost, we dash down the road and into fields, looking and serving. But if we're not careful, we will be asked, what are you seeking? And we will answer, incorrectly. Last fall, we took a risk to find an intentional interim who could lead our congregation through a regular checkup and internal work. Back in December, we thought we found our fit. Charlie worked with us for such a brief time before the pandemic hit. And let me tell you something, pastoring in any form during a pandemic is rough and tough work. Add to this our need of transition work and a situation arises in which it's impossible to do both. With his resignation fresh on our minds, I yearn to comfort and love on this community. But I also know that this is a moment where we have got to stop. The world is a dumpster fire right now. And we are people who want to be firefighters against the blaze of injustice. This is good. This is holy work. But it is imperative that we stop, put our oxygen masks on, and try to aid our community in its own hurts and pains. This is also holy work. Our families are living in anxiety. How can they work from home and raise kids? Now the school year is beginning and every decision feels like a dare with no perfect answer to the question of whether to go home, go online, or go back to face-to-face -face education. 
Our educators are once again being asked to risk their health as officials force face-to-face -face education. Our educators are also pushing themselves to learn the best online teaching practices because even in the face of a global pandemic, they are committed to our children and youth of this state and nation. Our healthcare workers and essential workers are risking their lives every day for the needs of our people. Some of our older folk are feeling the weight of loneliness as they sit at home or in care centers, missing out on human connection. And some of our people are drowning in financial peril as finding a job is nearly impossible in this climate. All the while, the pressures and anxieties are pressing down on us as we, yet again, seek to find another candidate to lead us through this turbulent season. <sighs> Anyone else feeling anxious with that list? This is a season in our church life where we must sit with the question, what are we seeking? In this moment, perhaps more than any other, we need to stop stretching ourselves thin and seek to sit together in this tension, fear, anxiety, and hurt. We're separated by computer screens and house walls, but we are still compelled to love and care for those who have committed themselves to our community. Now, I am by no means preaching that we stop our commitment to speaking truth to power or standing beside the oppressed and marginalized. I am, however, asking if we even know what we are seeking to do as a community anymore. Who are we, Lakeshore? What unites us? What feeds our collective soul? What and who are we fighting for? Who are we committed to caring for? Who are we to one another? Who are we to the world? And most importantly of all, what are we seeking? I pray that we use this time and season to reflect, rest, recharge, and revision. We're all tired worn thin and run ragged by the new reality in which we indwell. Before we rush to answer this question, may we sit and wrestle with it long enough to hear it properly. So, my beautiful Lakeshore, what are you seeking? Amen. Now, before you hear these words of benediction, you will see two links coming up in your chat. One is for the continued practice of tithing and giving. We know at times we are blessed, and from that extra blessing, we are called to pass our gifts on to each other, other organizations that we love that are working for the good of the people around us, and even our own church facility. The second link will be a link for parents with kiddos to gather in a Zoom room and lean on each other in this difficult season. As a reminder, please make sure your legal names are on your Zoom ID so that we can make sure that we are welcoming safe folks into our gathering. Now, hear these words. May the peace of God sustain you. May the love for each other fill, fill you. And may the work of Christ compel you to go out and live fully and wholly this day and the next. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you.